Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Yep. Before we get started today, I just want to do a brief access check uh, to talk about the accommodations that we have set up today, and then we will get started. Today, if you're joining us via Zoom, we have both American Sign Language interpretation and captioning courtesy of LC Interpreting Services. If you're joining us via Zoom and you require captioning, please refer to the button in the bottom of the screen, um, which is um, CC or closed captions. Uh, in these settings, you can turn on, enlarge, or view a full transcript of the captions. Uh, so you can view those uh, if you require them. We also have American Sign Language interpretation. Because we're in a webinar, uh, you have limited control over your uh, visibility, but we have taken the necessary steps to ensure that an interpreter from LC will be visible at all times, as a speaker uh, will only be on screen when they're speaking, and otherwise they will not. Um, since this program is a webinar rather than a meeting, we wanna both cover material and also encourage thoughts, questions, ideas, um, from the audience. And because of time constraints, we're conscious we may not get to all of these. So there are a few ways to submit questions and we wanna make sure that everyone has access. So if you would like to pose a question and you're using a Zoom video platform, please use the question and answer feature on the bottom of the screen. Um, there will be specific sections where we're calling for questions, but the Q&A button, you can utilize by typing questions into the Q&A feature. Um, please do not use the chat for questions. Please instead use the Q&A so we don't miss anything. And we will do the best we can to um, answer as many as possible. For anyone calling on their phone today, questions may be called or texted to the phone number 917-969-6702 at any time during the program. That phone number once again is 917-969-6702. In addition, um, during the Q&A time at the end of the program, callers may raise their hands by pressing star nine on their phone. If called on by a moderator and will identify you with your phone number, um, you'll be given access to speak and you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Since we might not have the opportunity to respond to all individual questions, we encourage you to follow up with unanswered questions or ideas after the event using um, all of the contact information that you will be receiving and seeing today based on your question and who it's for. Um, that concludes our access check this morning. I'm very happy to see so many people present in the audience today. And with that being said, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Commissioner of uh, Cultural Affairs, Deputy Commissioner Feinberg. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great, uh, panel discussion for today. Um, and we wanted to, I wanted to formally welcome you to the accessibility and inclusion in the virtual space. How cultural organizations can adapt and connect. This is one of a series of panel conversations that we are having and we're so excited to have this one with you. DCLA, we would like to take a moment to let all attendees know a few things. One, that this event will be recorded DCLA intends to post this recording on our website at a later date, and we may use all or part of the recording in the future or authorize others to use it for non-commercial purposes consistent with our mission. If you do not wish your name to be included in this recording, please direct any communications to disabilityfacilitator at culture.nyc.gov rather than using the chat feature, which will not be active during this event. If you do not wish to have either your name or phone number viable, visible to other participants or potential future viewers, we recommend that you exit this virtual event and watch the recording on our website when it is posted. As I was saying at the intro, this webinar is part of a series of planned discussions intended to help cultural groups connect with and learn from one another, as well as get the latest information from local government. This program is funded in part by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development's Community Development Block Grant Program. And we thank them for their support. Um, we, after this event, we will be sending out a post-webinar survey via email 
We appreciate your responses to help inform future events and programs, as well as to ensure compliance with the program's federal funding. The recording of this event and presentation slides will be posted on the DCLA website and a link will be sent via email to all registrants when they are available. I want to now introduce the session. Um, today's program will be a presentation and discussion on best practices and techniques to increase access and inclusion for audiences during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. The Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities will present tips, technical guidance, and resources for inclusive practices. A moderated panel featuring members of the New York City cultural community will explore opportunities, challenges, and lessons learned regarding the critical goal of inclusion in the digital space that we rely upon more and more during this time. It's now my pleasure to again say thank you to everybody for coming. I wanted to just say that. And also to introduce Annie Least. We are very excited to have Annie Least as our moderator today. Some of you may know she was at DCLA before her current role. Um, Annie is an artist living and working in D New York City. She creates work exploring the experience of navigating urban spaces from the perspective of someone who has low vision. In parallel with her art career, Annie has worked in the cultural accessibility field for over 10 years, including two years here at DCLA. As our first ever external affairs and disability inclusion associate. She is currently an associate educator in community and access programs at the Museum of Modern Art. So without further ado, Annie, let's get started. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner Feinberg, Sheila, formal colleague. <laughs> um, I uh, am so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much to my wonderful friends at DCLA, the Department of Cultural Affairs, for inviting me to be here with you all this morning. And particular thanks again to all of you uh, out there in Zoom land <laughs> who are joining us. Um, we're so excited that so many of you are taking this time to explore with us a topic that we believe is incredibly important, um, helping make the arts and culture uh, world more accessible and inclusive um, for folks with disabilities, even when we can't come together in uh, a real space and we're doing things virtually and remotely. Um, first things first, my name is Annie Least, that's L-E-I-S as in Sam, T as in Thomas, and I will be your humble moderator today. Um, I am a white cis woman with hair that is currently the color uh, that we used to call dirty dishwater blonde, um, blondish, brownish, grayish. Um, it's a little bit wavy and it's currently pulled back in a ponytail. Um, I'm wearing a bright red scoop neck top and some black earrings with little gold um, sort of markings in them. Um, and you can't really see much uh, of my background behind me other than a taupe colored wall. Um, so I use she, her pronouns and I also identify as a disabled person. My disability is a visual one. Um, I have no vision in my right eye and very limited vision in my left. Um, so you're going to hear each of us provide a verbal description of ourselves when we introduce ourselves, which is a great uh, practice to get into both virtually and when we get back to real life programming. Um, it's extremely helpful for those of us who can't see who's in the room and what folks look like. So this may be a new practice for some of you, and that's okay. We're going to share a lot of uh, information and practices that may be unfamiliar, uh, that may be unfamiliar today. Um, in addition to all of that information, we're also gonna be uh, hearing from and about folks who have been actually learning and implementing these practices in their own virtual or remote uh, cultural programming over the past few months. And I think we can all agree, the past few months have been unusual to say the least, right? 
um, and particularly challenging for arts and culture organizations. Um, not only are we having to reach our audiences in new ways, but we're doing so at a time of great economic pressure um, and tremendous political uncertainty, um, some civic unrest and some serious reckonings in our country and worldwide um, about who we are and who we include um, and equity and diversity. And of course, serious health concerns. And for many of us, great personal stress. So I just want everybody here to know that we in, on this team and those of us who are participating in this program, we recognize and we honor these things. Um, we honor these challenges and uh, just want you to be aware that we feel you. <laughs> um, and given this context, I have a few suggestions for you as we move forward with this program. And as you start to approach um, your own work in growing the accessibility and inclusion of your programming, it's particularly that stuff that's online or remote. Um, so the first one is start where you are. We are all in different places in our efforts to welcome folks with disabilities, and that's totally okay. Um, you don't have to know everything before you jump in and try something. Try to reach disabled audience members, try to get new disabled audience members. Um, you're going to hear from, um, you're going to hear from panelists in the second portion of this program um, that, you know, adapting to this what, new virtual environment was a learning experience for everybody, programmers and audiences alike. We definitely learned that, um, we definitely learned that at MoMA too. And we, you know, also learned that our audiences really appreciated our transparency about uh, what we knew and what we didn't know and how we were all learning together. So don't be afraid to just start. Second tip is um, work with what you have. Resources are limited these days, we get it. And yes, um, some access accommodations do cost money. In my opinion, it's definitely money well spent, um, but many access accommodations don't cost a thing. Um, some are about just changing a setting. Um, some are about getting really creative um, in how you present things um, or connect with your audiences. And some are about shifting an attitude. You already have what you need to start making your offerings more accessible. Um, and the third tip is see the advantages. Um, the virtual remote or, or remote programming environment provides lots of new challenges. That's definitely true. But there are also new opportunities. Um, folks who can't visit our institutions in person can now participate in our programming. That's amazing. Um, we're also no longer limited by what's on view in our museums or the physical capacity of our theaters and concert halls. And perhaps most importantly for our purposes today, starting something new means that we can build accessibility and inclusion into our programs from the ground up, right from the beginning. We can actually reimagine how we welcome people, especially the over 1 billion people in the world who live with some form of disability. That's 15% of the world's population. And if the recent election toss, talk, taught us anything, 15% is a huge margin, right? Um, and we now have a chance to um, a new opportunity to welcome them in a new way. So without further ado, let's get going. As, as Sheila mentioned, our program has two major parts. First, we're gonna have a presentation from two amazing folks from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities or MOPD um, that will give you some great practices and strategies and a lot of information about how to make your virtual programming more accessible. Next, we're gonna have a panel discussion that features panelists who will share their actual experiences in doing this work in the cultural sector over the past few months in particular. I do wanna remind you that as questions arise, you can type them into Zoom's Q&A feature at any time. And I'll be asking our presenters, some of them uh, at various times throughout the program. Um, if you can't access the Q&A feature, again, you may also text or call the phone number 917-969-9999. Um, 
um, to ask your question. Um, if neither of these options are accessible to you, sit tight. We hope to have a little bit of time uh, to give a few folks an opportunity to uh, raise their hand and ask their questions verbally at the end of the program. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first speakers from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Wale Sabri is MOPD's Digital Accessibility Coordinator, and that's W-A-L-E-I-S-A-B, as in boy, R-Y. And then we also have John Novak, who is MOPD's Outreach Manager, that's J-O-N, N-O-V as in Victor, I-C-K. So guys, if you'd like to join me on screen and on mic, I turn it over to you. Please take it away. Thank you, Annie. Thank you very much, Annie. I'm going to start now by sharing my screen. Everyone should still be able to view uh, the presentation as well as uh, captioning and American Sign Language. Um, so great. Um, okay, so my name is Jonathan Novick. You saw me before with the access check, and I'm the outreach manager for the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Wale? Um, my name is Wale Sabri. I'm the digital accessibility coordinator. Should we do our image descriptions now? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm a Middle Eastern man in my mid 30s. Uh, my pronouns are he slash him. I also identify as blind. I have um, olive skin and brownish hazelish eyes. Um, I used to say I have pandemic hair, but that was just an excuse. It was a cover. I've been growing my hair for about a year now. I have dark curly hair, which I have tied up um, in the back to look neat uh, today. Um, and I'm wearing a V-neck red sweater. Uh, that's a similar color to Annie's, as well as I am wearing um, some white classic um, uh, Apple headphones uh, headset right now, and I'm in the in, in a living room. Great, thank you, Wale. And I am a late twenties um, little person. I'm not standing, but I have smaller arms and legs. I am uh, Caucasian. I have somewhat, it's not too long, um, medium hair, a uh, little bit longer uh, brown hair. I'm wearing over ear uh, black headphones. I'm sitting in a well lit room filled with books and plants and I'm wearing a blue and black checkered shirt. Uh, with that being said, let's get started. We're gonna be working off of a slide deck today that you will be receiving in your email. So feel free to take as much or as little notes as you would like. Uh, and it's called Virtual Accessibility for Cultural Institutions by the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Um, one quick note, uh, one quick note about our presentation. Uh, we are fitting in a two hour presentation into 30 minutes. So we will be kind of sort of rushing through this. Um, but uh, you can always follow up with us with any questions and uh, we, we'd be happy to send you the slides if, if needed. Uh, we also have guides on nyc.gov slash accessibility guides. You can download our virtual meetings accessibility guide there. Absolutely, so our goal today is to get you familiar with these concepts and enough so you can um, you know, share uh, the resources that we've, uh, Take a look at the resources we've put together and familiarize yourself with these practices. So uh, we're going to get started with a few uh, introductory things. So just very briefly, language tips. Our office recommends using what's called person first language. So when referring to people with disabilities, whether in theater, in performance, or so on and so forth, um, use person first language. That's putting the person first, person with a disability rather than disabled person, people with disabilities instead of the disabled, and substituting specific disabilities uh, outside of, um, uh, you know, just the, the word disability. So person with cerebral palsy, person who is blind or low vision, but ultimately everyone has their individual preferences, especially in the art world, people with disabilities, artists with disabilities might have specific words that they want to use, so just follow their lead. This next slide just goes over briefly some terms not to use. Um, just refer back to person first language. You can never go wrong with person first language or mirroring language that you are, um, that you hear from a person that you are working with. Additionally, for the word handicapped, you can always replace that with accessible or disabled. So accessible parking, accessible entrance or disabled athletes. Except accessible ramp, et cetera. Uh, to briefly touch on the laws that we're gonna be going over or where we're coming from today, Wale, do you wanna go over these? Sure, um, we have the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990, and that um, defines 
creates a legal definition of a disability as well as uh, protects people with disabilities from being discriminated against uh, and requires that uh, businesses, state and local government accommodate people with disabilities. Uh, more locally, um, for city government specifically, we have Local Law 26 and 28, which only applies for city agencies, but um, we can all learn lessons from those. So Local Law 26 is requiring us, uh, city agencies, to make our websites and digital content accessible. Uh, Local Law 28 uh, requires that city uh, agencies include accessibility information when they advertise events for the public. Um, and so this is basically your way of inviting, if you copy this model of including accessibility language, it's your way of inviting the disability community to come to your events. And we'll get into that in more depth in uh, some later slides. Absolutely. So this slide goes over our presentation outline, and you'll be familiar with some of the things we're already discussing. But in essence, we're going to be going through planning of an accessible virtual event starting with choosing accessible virtual spaces, how to promote your virtual event with inclusion in mind, hiring accessibility professionals like American Sign Language interpreters and captioning, how to set up your technology, accessibility during the event, and then some accessible online cultural programming examples. So let's start with choosing an accessible meeting platform and things to keep in mind. Wale? And since we're getting started, um, we want to be also just lead by example and describe our slides. Um, can you just give us a description of the general slide layout? Absolutely. So our layout, um, our design that we are using for our friends on the phone and for anyone who is blind or low vision, um, we have a colorful ribbon on the top uh, part of our presentation, a black and white uh, mayor's office for people with disabilities logo, uh, and a colorful array of accessibility icons. Um, uh, physical accessibility icon, a person who is uh, using a, a mobility cane, uh, braille icon, assistive listening icon, and American Sign Language icon. In the bottom left, we have our Twitter uh, handle and a logo, at NYC Disabilities. That's at NYC Disabilities. If you have anything, uh, if you want to follow us on social or tweet about us or tweet at us, you can use at NYC Disabilities. Thank you, John. And we will be uh, periodically, we are, as we advance slides, we'll read the slide title and describe any relevant images. So this slide title is Choosing Accessible Meeting Platforms. So what are you looking for uh, when you're picking your meeting platform, such as Zoom, Teams, uh, Google Meet, et cetera? Um, so first of all, screen reader accessibility. Um, screen readers are a type of technology that blind folks use. Uh, to access devices such as computers. And as the name implies, they read aloud what is on the screen. So you wanna make sure that there's support for screen readers in that platform. Keyboard access as well, right? Making sure there are keyboard shortcuts. So um, today we're using Zoom um, and for the panelists, Alt-A uh, on Windows, mutes and unmutes, Alt-V uh, turns on or off the video, right? Uh, and there's keyboard shortcuts for Mac as well. Um, and uh, support for captions, right? We have captioning today. So, um, you know, some way to be able to assign a captioner and turn that on and off. Um, support for video and video uh, being able to pin a person's screen for American Sign Language um, and support for audience participation, whether it's chat, questions and answers or raise hand features. Next slide. Uh, recommended accessible meeting platforms. And we have the logos um, of those platforms that we have listed. So we've done our own research, uh, tested um, some platforms as well as just, um, you know, learned from the community. So the ones that we do recommend are Zoom, what we're using today, uh, Google Hangout, uh, well, Google Meet, but it's also called Google Hangouts, depending um, on who you ask. Uh, and Microsoft Teams. So uh, micro, uh, Zoom pretty much supports all of the features we mentioned, um, and uh, so does Google Meet. Uh, Google Meet has an additional perk in that it has automated captions. And while they are pretty impressive and great, we always advocate that you have um, human-generated captions for the best quality. Um, Teams also, Microsoft Teams, does have a beta feature of automated captions. Um, but it's not available in all their platforms. Um, and to be honest, Microsoft Teams has had some, uh, is, been, is known to not be consistently usable and accessible. So it's not as robust or as reliable as the other two. 
some honorable mentions uh, that are not on this slide. WebEx and GoToMeeting are known for not being accessible. So don't use those. Next slide is accessible communications. communications. Is that you? Is that me? Uh, no, keep going. So the okay. next slide is uh, digital accessibility. Okay. Um, so um, now that you've chosen your platform, uh, you want to make sure that you're uh, creating accessible flyers, materials, event registration pages, et cetera, and your social media posts as well. Um, so we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna kind of get into a little bit of uh, that in the next few slides. Um, so the next slide is, so digital accessibility best practices. So when you're creating flyers, or slides or handouts um, for your events, you should keep the following things in mind. Um, so alt text for images. So whenever you're adding images into your document, your email, your social media posts, there's a feature called alternative text that allows you to add a description to your image. Your description could be NYC logo or DCLA logo, right? Something meaningful for a blind person who's not gonna be able to see that image. Um, tagging, uh, proper tagging of headings, links, lists, tables, etc. So a lot of designers are really good at making things look the way that they should look, but underneath the hood, they don't actually have the proper formatting. And when they don't have that proper formatting, assistive technologies such as screen readers are not able to interpret it the right way to, so that folks who are blind or other people with disabilities can effectively um, consume that information. So um, for instance, using the heading styles in Word or using, uh, if you're creating a PDF, using proper tags like heading tags, paragraph tags, link tags, list tags, et cetera. Um, making sure you have good color contrast uh, for the text against the background so that folks with low vision are able to read it easily, right? Um, and so an example of that is like, the typical black text on a white background is pretty good um, contrast as opposed to yellow text on a white background. Those two colors are bright and would be harder to read. Um, using plain language is, uh, is also important as we are in New York City and we have, uh, whether it's folks, we wanna include folks with developmental intellectual disabilities or folks with limited English proficiency, plain language is defined as text that could be understood from the first read. Um, some tips about that is, you know, use more common terms, uh, avoid using, you know, large words or big words, uh, technical language as much as possible, avoid using those. Use more commonly used words um, that are simpler and easier to understand. Use shorter sentences instead of long run-on sentences. Use the active voice. So you're cordially invited to our event, right? Um, or you can apply for food stamps, you can, you know, et cetera. Um, and yeah, um, and then you should be able to have your, you know, materials and documents in either accessible word format or accessible PDF. Accessible word, um, is a bit easier, uh, and, um, is more preferred by the community, but there is such a thing as an accessible PDF. Um, we do have our accessibility guides again at nyc.gov slash accessibility guides, plural. Great. Uh, while I, we're going to need to pick it up a little bit. Sure. Um, event pages and RSVPs. So just um, things to keep in mind. There are accessible ones and there are not accessible ones. So some ones that we have listed here, Ticket Leap is an, uh, platform, a ticketing platform that's known for being accessible. Eventbrite is another platform that is technically accessible, but a pain to use, um, but it is technically accessible. Um, and Google Forms is not necessarily a ticketing platform, but it is a way you can collect registrations, uh, RSVPs for your event that is accessible. Some uh, tips to keep in mind, um, avoid using time limits for purchasing tickets. Um, event price is, is a repeat offender of this. You have eight minutes to purchase your ticket and people with disabilities, we generally end up taking a little bit more time uh, getting to our credit card information and so on and so forth. So we'll have spent all this time and effort and just we're about, as we're about to press purchase, we run out of time, we have to repeat the whole process again. And after an experience like that, and that's personally happened to me, after an experience like that, I don't wanna give you my money. 
Um, so also you should have alternatives for uh, registering, whether it's by using uh, registering by email or by phone, because not everybody wants to be uh, using computers and devices. So I will take over from here. So social media accessibility. This actually answers a question that somebody put into the Q&A. Um, so uh, with social media, specifically with screen readers, so for somebody who is blind or low vision and uses a software to listen to content out loud, it primarily interacts with text that's written. When it comes to images and graphics, there's not AI strong enough currently um, that can interpret what this means. This is where alt text comes in, alt text or image descriptions, which are a written description of any image that's shared through social media. This is also applicable to electronic documents and websites, but principally it is a line of code that you, the author, write that describes your image. It's supported by Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, but also the additional programs as well, um, Microsoft Word, different web platforms, et cetera. Um, so for more information on social media, check out our accessible social media guide, uh, which is available on the link that Wally shared before. Videos, if you're playing any kind of videos within your presentation, there's two things you need to account for, and that's what, that make, and that's what makes up a video. There's the audio, um, which needs to also have captioning. So all videos must be captioned for audiences who are deaf or hard of hearing. But also there is audio description for um, individuals who are blind or low vision. Any important visual information that's not noted by sound must be described out loud. For videos, this is an extra narrative track. And for theatrical performances, this is someone either speaking into a microphone or perhaps speaking into a microphone that corresponds with someone's headset and they're listening so they can experience everything through sound. For more information on this, check out our audio description and captioning guide, also available at the digital accessibility website that Wale mentioned. And at the end of our part here, if we have a few minutes, we have some cool examples to play for you with audio description, sign language, and captions. Absolutely. So advertising accessibility. So when it comes to actually advertising your event, we refer to Local Law 28 of 2016. So if you are a member of a city agency like, D, um, like DCLA, you must include three pieces of information within all of your advertisements. This uh, answers the questions, what accommodations will be present at your, um, at your event? Who can someone reach out to to request accommodations? And what's the deadline to do so? In summary, it would be something like this. Uh, please join um, you know, the mayor's office for people with disabilities for a presentation on virtual accessibility. There will be ASL and captioning to request additional accommodations. Please reach out to Wale by this time. A few sentences makes a big difference when advertising accessibility. And while this Possible, is not required of you, it, it's just, it's a clear message that you are welcoming the disability community when you do that. That's right. So possible accommodation requests that you might receive, ASL interpretation, we have that here today, courtesy of LC Interpreting Services. This is a person who will um, you know, be listening to you and interpreting everything. If we're talking about a virtual meeting, it's very simple. The only thing you need to do is invite them to the meeting and they have um, uh, their camera turned on and they interpret. When it comes to actually um, ensuring that people can see them. There are different settings based on your platform where people can pin or isolate or spotlight interpreters. So it's important to do that research, but hiring an ASL interpreter is just hiring an ASL interpreter and ensuring they have a good internet connection. Uh, communication uh, access real-time translation or CART or captioning. Um, once again, this is um, hiring a captioner and um, this might require a little bit of a conversation regarding what platform that you're using and what's the best way to integrate. With Zoom, it's very simple. You hire them and um, before the meeting starts, you just provide them with the role of captioner and then they're able to provide the rest. And finally, accessible electronic documents and slides, Word documents, PDFs, and slide decks. Um, adhering to information that we went over before, these should be visually accessible, the content should be understandable, and they should be digitally accessible so they can be understood by a screen reader. If someone is not able to interact with them in the way that you're sharing them, like we're sharing this PowerPoint, you should be prepared to send them to attendees so they can interact with them in that way. When it comes to hiring accessibility professionals, you'll notice that we have some, um, some hyperlinks. The uh, titles are underlined. We do have a list of ASL interpreters, CART vendors, and also audio describers that you can check out on our website if you are looking for professionals. Um, technology, when it comes to technology, it's important that you um, take the time to understand the platform that you're working with 
and how the accommodations fit into the, you know, to what you're doing. Understand for Zoom how to turn on captioning. Understand for ASL the instructions you need to provide somebody to use ASL. Um, even if you've already done it before, you should at least allot 15 minutes beforehand to get settled. If not, I would give yourself a few days if you're doing something for the first time to really make sure you got it. Um, in addition, make sure your presenters and accessibility professionals have downloaded the platform that you are using ahead of time. Otherwise, that might get you into a sticky situation. Then expectations of presenters. I can well, handle I it from here. Yep. Thank you. Um, so make sure that your presenters, panelists uh, know what their responsibilities are. And that starts with, and John and I have not been doing a great good job at this, um, but uh, one person speaking at a time. And that's for the benefit of the audience members, but also the access professionals. Um, you know, interpreters and captioners cannot interpret slash caption for two people at a time. Uh, if you will be speaking, you should say your name first and organization. Um, so John and I haven't necessarily been doing this a whole lot, but we would be like, if I had something to say, I would say, you know, this is Wale um, from MOPD and just say whatever I need to say. Um, in terms of um, in descriptive, being descriptive, right? Um, uh, we uh, encourage you to let your uh, panelists or presenters know that they should be describing what is on their slides by reading the slide titles as they advance. We've been doing that today and mentioning any relevant images um, and describing them. Uh, furthermore, uh, your presenters uh, and panelists are responsible for making their um, content accessible, uh, their slides, their handouts, uh, they're, they're responsible for that. And um, if, if, because if they don't do that, then ultimately that responsibility will fall on you. Um, so be sure uh, to let folks know what their responsibilities are. And once again, we have our guides, nyc.gov slash accessibility guides, where you can download a bunch of guides on this, whether it's creating accessible documents, slides, um, social media posts, videos, et cetera. Um, next slide is we've come full circle. It's access check. So we started this event with an access check and we encourage everyone to incorporate this into their events meetings, performances uh, that you're holding virtually or even physically. Um, so you wanna mention what accommodations you have set up, uh, whether it's American Sign Language or captions and how to access them. Uh, you wanna get folks familiar with the platform um, by learning how to turn on the captions um, or uh, pin the, the video of an interpreter. Uh, but also some common shortcuts for muting or unmuting, uh, turning video on or off, et cetera. And you also wanna include phone instructions, right? So we mentioned that mute is Alt-A on Windows, it's Command-Shift-A on Mac, and um, on the phone, it is star six. Um, so it's, it's important to kind of let folks know these things uh, so that they can properly participate uh, and, and know how to participate. Um, also let folks know that you will be describing uh, images um, in your presentation and encourage them to do the same. Um, All right, Wale, we're gonna need to wrap up uh, in just a minute so we can have time for questions. Sounds good. So um, we have now went through like virtual programming in general. Uh, we have some slides on some good examples of what cultural institutions are doing currently in this uh, time. So, um, so uh, that includes verbal, verbal description tours and audio description tours, ASL tours, um, uh, some virtual galleries that are online and accessible, autism friendly programming, um, and performances that have audio description, sign language, and um, captions. So uh, verbal description tours, if you are not familiar with those, those are typically held in museums uh, where folks, uh, professionals, um, describe art to folks who are blind. Um, so now there are uh, being held uh, virtually, whether it's on a platform like Zoom or by uh, conference phone dial-in. Um, and some, uh, some folks that are doing this right now, um, the Met uh, is doing this and these are links on our slides. So um, you can uh, access them by getting to the slides or we also have our, um, uh, our virtual accessibility toolkit, uh, activities toolkit, uh, which I will read the link for in a second, but uh, the Guggenheim has verbal description tours, 
the Whitney, and also the MoMA, which we didn't get to, um, um, uh, Poster House and the MoMA, which we didn't get to add to the slide. But if you want to find out more about what other institutions are doing, um, you can check out uh, the list that we put together of accessible virtual activities uh, at nyc.gov slash disability dash virtual activities. Uh, next slide is recorded audio descriptions. So um, there are some recorded descriptions of works of art. The Guggenheim has one as well as the Whitney. Next, we have um, virtual ASL tours. Uh, these would be tours for folks who are deaf in American Sign Language. Um, and uh, there's a list of uh, those events happening virtually. Uh, deaf NYC um, has a list, as well as the Whitney has some recorded videos with ASL of um, discussions or uh, you know, uh, of their works of art. Um, and then some online art galleries that are worth mentioning. Um, and uh, we are shamelessly self-promoting here, but uh, an online art gallery would basically be a web page with you know, works of art, images of works of art on it. Um, and the way to make that accessible, we've mentioned already is using alternative text and being descriptive uh, in the art. So some examples you can check out. Uh, we created two actually um, art galleries, uh, virtual art galleries this summer and spring. Uh, one of them is called The Journey, uh, featuring artists with disabilities. One of them is called Our History, uh, which is about the disability rights history in New York City. Um, New York City Parks also has uh, a collection called the, I think, Disability Awareness, featuring artists with disabilities uh, that we've uh, uh, worked with them on making accessible as well as um, Helen Keller, the Helen Keller archives has a lot of great stuff that you can check out. Um, and um, autism friendly programming, uh, Daniel's Music Foundation has some great autism friendly programming um, and uh, music for autism as well. They have a YouTube channel that is pretty popular. Right. We're going to need um, to wrap it up in 30 seconds. To open okay, well, uh, we're coming here to the home stretch. Uh, we're uh, so in terms of performances, uh, we have two examples here that we wanted to show you, but I guess we don't have time. Uh, but, uh, you know, audio description, once again, American Sign Language and captioning. The uh, Chicago Culture and Arts Consortium has some really great examples of how to do that um, on their YouTube channel. And those are the links that we have listed here, which uh, unfortunately we don't have time for today. And now we just have um, some resources, um, a bunch of the links that we already talked about for guides uh, that we've created, uh, but nyc.gov slash accessibility guides. Um, and I think, uh, and, no, and another relevant one is nyc.gov slash disability dash virtual activities. All right, so Annie has joined us to help uh, facilitate some questions that the audience has had for us. Once again, to get this out up top, we went through a lot of links and a lot of resources, all of which are embedded in this PowerPoint that you will receive. So uh, I hope that calms some panic in terms of how fast we had to go. Um, great. Thank you guys so much. This is Annie speaking again. And I just want to, if we were in a room, um, I would encourage everyone to applaud. So you can <laughs> feel welcome to applaud um, from your own home um, we, uh, or your own workplace, wherever you're joining us from. Um, thank you guys. That was great. And uh, there has been a lot of question about how things will be shared. If you are registered, if you are in this room, uh, or even if you registered and didn't arrive, you will be receiving links to both the, the slide presentation itself and a recording of this webinar. So um, there's been a few q and I just want to address a couple of them that I already answered very quickly and then offer a couple of them to you. Um, someone said, is Zoom's registration accessible? My response was reasonably. Um, and I say that because it definitely does not have the timed um, the timed issue that Wale was talking about in terms of Eventbrite. And we haven't found any um, accessibility issues specific to Zoom's registration. MoMA has been using that as well for some of our programs. You all used it for, uh, you all used Eventbrite for this program, but Zoom's built-in registration 
it can be a little confusing sometimes. And sometimes the best thing to do is not require registration at all. In many ways, that's the most accessible thing to do. Um, so that's something to bear in mind, depending on what you're offering. Um, uh, we're going to, I'm going to throw a closed captioning question to the guys, but I also want to address that or acknowledge that I answered someone's question about um, do screen readers read alt text and again to affirm what the what the folks said, they only read the alt text that you have put in so every program every digital platform has a different way um, for you to put alt text and that's where these wonderful MOPD guides will be handy, um, because they can share they can tell you exactly how to do it on all of your social media platforms and also in all of your documents. Um, another question that uh, that was answered was about um, accessible templates on uh, website platforms like Wix and Squarespace. Speaking from personal experience, yes, they do have some accessible screen reader friendly templates. Um, you just have to Google them and find those lists on their support pages. Um, so that's part of what's been going on in the Q&A, but I wanna um, also throw some questions out to you all. Um, so a lot of these online platforms have um, artificially generated captioning. We're using live captioning today. I'm wondering if y'all can talk just a little bit about um, the differences between the two and, and what you find is, is the best solution. Sure thing. So automated captioning has come a long way. I will start with that, but say it's still not something that should be uh, fully dependent on, especially for somebody who has requested it. While audio descriptor, sorry, while captioning automated, while automated captioning can, you know, get a lot of words correct, there's still issues with timing, assigning who is saying what, especially if you have multiple speakers. Um, you'll notice today with our captioning, anytime someone says anything, there's a name in front of it. Um, which is very helpful for somebody who is depending on those captioning captions, but also, um, you know, proper nouns, uh, other words, you know, people's names, things like that. This is a very common pitfall for captioning. So when referring to a character, a location, uh, you know, if you're doing a documentary or a play about the Kosciuszko Bridge, automated captioning will fail you. And um, when you add up all of these things, it's difficult for somebody who is depending on the caption solely. So it's always best to, um, you know, roll your sleeves up and put captions into your videos or hire a professional captioner to type things out. I will say that the automated captioning in YouTube and Facebook is a nice starting point if you go back and edit them uh, and, uh, and, you know, take care of that timing and cleaning up those mistakes. But ultimately, no, we're not at a point where automated captioning should be solely relied upon. Can I add to that? Um, I think there, there's also folks who kind of ask us, um, are there volunteer services for captioning and American Sign Language interpreting? To which the answer is emphatically no. Um, access is a labor and you know we need to be compensating folks um, who do this, this kind of work. That's a great question, Wale. I mean, that's a great comment, Wale, and it actually is a good segue into another question that I had uh, for you guys. Can you talk a little bit about, about cost? Um, how much does uh, ca captioning and, uh, and ASL interpretation tend to run, and do you know of any funding sources out there? John? So as far as funding sources, um, I don't know of anything. Depending on where you specifically work, you should have a budget for that. Um, there should be something set aside for accommodations or there could be. Unfortunately, there is no specific um, area to go. The rates are dependent on um, specific agencies uh, and the rates also are adjusted dependent on um, how long you need the service for because it might double up the if I could just get one second I can spout off some actual numbers for a range I just want to in the I don't meantime I'll, I'll um uh, I will say that art New York um does provide some funding uh for I think theater um theater organizations uh in terms of access uh, and providing access so that's one funding source that you might want to reach out to called art New York 
great funding. It's a great recommendation, Wally. Thank you. And if you see me sort of squinting and screwing up my face, that's my I'm trying to read your questions as fast as I can in the Q&A box face. So please forgive any strange expressions that anyone might see. Um, I think we're now we're going to take a pause on the questions. There's a lot of them. There's some wonderful ones. Thank you all for putting in all your questions. Um, a lot of these I know will be answered, um, can be found. The answers can be found in the links and the resources that you're going to get in this PowerPoint. Um, several others, I think, will be better addressed to our panelists. Um, so I want to applaud um, John and Wale again. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having us. And um, thank you. We appreciate you and your brains and your offerings and your information and recommendations today. So thank you so much for joining us. So now we're going to move on to the next portion of our program. Um, just a reminder, and you all seem to remember this, please feel free to keep putting your questions um, in the uh, Q&A feature. Um, and also don't panic, we are going to share the slides and the webinar recording both with you. Um, and also, you're also gonna get our contact information um, on the last slide of the slide deck. So we'll share it with you today, but it will also be available when you download the slide deck uh, in the future. So you can reach out to all of us individually. So now the next portion of our program, we're going to um, talk about how some folks are applying these learns in the real world or the real virtual world, if you will. I'd love to invite our three panelists to join me on camera and on mic um, so that we can begin our conversation. Um, and we're going to just talk a little bit about uh, the work that actual people working in actual New York City cultural organizations are doing to make their virtual programs and meetings and presentations and cultural offerings more accessible. So thank you to all of you who are with us today. Um, I am going to not even attempt to introduce these wonderful panelists, um, but I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and also describe themselves and tell us just a little bit about what their role is in the organization that they work with. So let's begin with Bojana Kokliat of the Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium. And that's first name Bojana, B-O-J-A-N-A, -A, last name Kokliat. C-O-K-L-Y-A-T of the Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, otherwise known as MAC. Bojana? Hi, Bojana here. Uh, I'm a white woman with uh, brown hair and a bob. I have some bangs and I'm wearing a vintage shirt with a gold collar uh, against a black knit shirt. I uh, have some artwork behind me on a very light green wall. I use uh, she, her pronouns. I am also uh, living with a disability. I live with a visual disability. Um, I live with low vision. Uh, and I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bojana. I appreciate it. Um, and now let's um, uh, let's move on for uh, Naomi um, Naomi Goldberg Haas. Um, that's G O L D B E R G H A S S. Um, she works for Dances for a Variable Population. Thank you so much, Annie, for the introduction for everyone else who's here today. I want to tell you about myself. I have chronic lupus for over 35 years, which affects my ability to try, write and also to speak clearly. I have I wear short black hair, which is now silver gray speckled, and wearing a blue shirt with plants and, and books and pictures in my background of my bedroom. I use the pronouns she, her. And I'm, I work, I run the Dances for a Variable Population, whose mission it is to support strong creative movement for people of all ages with special focus on older adults. I'm talking too fast. <laughs> we, com we completely pivoted in the ways that we offer programming in the event of COVID. We now offer 25 remote classes, seven days a week, with an attendance of over 500 without internet access. We also offer telephone conference-based classes. That's awesome, Naomi. Thank you so much. I talk so fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We'll 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 take a breath for a second. Give our interpreters a moment to catch up if they need it. Um, and um, we're also going to get more opportunity to get into those programs um, that you mentioned in a couple minutes. 
Greg, would you like to introduce yourself? We have Greg Mosgala, G-R-E-G-G, -G -G, uh, last name M-O-Z-G-A-L-A, -A, who is coming to us from Queens Theater. Hi, thank you, Annie. Um, yes, my name is Greg. I'm a, a white cisgender male. I have short brown hair and a brown beard currently. Uh, hazel eyes, I'm wearing a green shirt. I'm in my bedroom where you can see uh, white doors behind me and the walls are painted a dark, dark midnight blue. I also uh, identify as disabled. I have cerebral palsy. Uh, I'm the director of inclusion at Queens Theater. Um, and uh, it's a new position. I was hired about two years ago um, in an effort to more accurately fulfill Queens Theater's mission statement, which is to provide uh, first class art, uh, a variety of diverse first class art to the 2.2 million people living in Queens uh, and the surrounding metropolitan area, the five boroughs of New York City. Um, it was really as part of that mission, um, the executive director uh, and others on staff realized that they weren't putting a lot of attention to this area, uh, to this population, which is roughly 20% of the population. So how could we be more inclusive of everyone in our community? And uh, we're looking at that both um, through our, our structures, our buildings, uh, our workforce and our programming. That's great, Greg, thank you so much. And now that we've heard just brief introductions and we have a sense of what you all look like, let's jump in to the conversation. Um, really appreciate all of these folks being here. Um, so starting with a, a grounding question or, or uh, and some of you have already begun to answer this a little bit, um, I'd love for each of you to share, to talk briefly little bit how um, your institution's priorities around accessibility, um, what they are, and maybe how they've changed uh, over the past uh, two or three months since the pandemic. Um, and Greg, you kind of got into this. Do you want to kind of finish the thought and, and share with us how uh, things have changed a little bit for you all? Sure. Well, everything has changed, uh, <laughs> quite Bye. simply. Um, but more specifically, uh, I would say, uh, we pivoted very quickly to online programming. I think to date, uh, we've programmed over uh, about 110 uh, virtual uh, programs and events uh, since the lockdown. Um, and one thing that we want to do really, uh, specifically as it relates to disability, we the major initiative at Queen's Theatre is called Theatre for All, or TFA for short. Um, and we have two major prongs of that. Uh, one is a uh, playmaking and play reading program. Uh, that will present the work of both uh, disabled playwrights and work that contains disabled characters. Um, and we also started a uh, two-week intensive training program uh, called TFA Training, uh, which we have offered for the past two years uh, live and in person, but we again have made that all virtual this year. It's always been a national program, uh, but we provide uh, training uh, like standard acting training that you would get at a conservatory um, uh, for uh, deaf and disabled actors um, all across the spectrum of disability um, for, for people all throughout the country. Um, this year, because we moved to Zoom, that, that program is currently going on. We're in our second week. Um, uh, we decided to mainly focus on uh, monologue study and scene study. And because people are entering from all different points of experience, uh, and training levels, uh, even knowledge about disability, uh, we decided to develop two tracks, a beginner and advanced track uh, for that training program this year. And also, I think it's uh, notable that our uh, staff of teaching artists uh, is, is integrated as well with uh, disabled teaching artists and non-disabled teaching artists. Um, but for us, uh, all our work around this area is rooted in mission. Again, what is our mission? How do we stay true to that mission? And how do we reach the most people possible uh, within Queens, within the five boroughs, the metropolitan area, and as, as we're doing now th throughout the country? I love that. And Queens Theater has always been one of my favorite examples of an organization that really has embraced accessibility and inclusion at all levels of the organization from the top down, the bottom up, mission driven. So I'm very happy that we have you here today, Greg. Thank you. Um, uh, Naomi, do you want to share a little bit about, um, you started talking about, in particular, one of your programs. Um, how, has, how has that sort of process of offering that program changed for you in the past few months? Everything's changed. Everything has changed. So now it's, now we never offer remote programming, and now we do. I, we offer a lot. 
we, we had to band together as a team of artists to figure out how this could happen. And one thing that we came up with, of course, was Zoom, but also was this telephone conferencing class and just the surprise that people could, could actually learn dance through just audit, auditorially. So we've developed those programs. So auditorily, um, can you say a little bit more about how you did that? We, we looked at our core program, which is called Movement Speaks, and we just adjusted so, so it could work without actually demonstrating on, on screen or in person. People could just kind of get the idea of what it is to dance and to make dances. And we, we use the terminology was very clear, the terminology of what is dancing about. Mm -hmm. And you're offering that program over the phone as well as yes. uh, over the computer, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a different program. So uh, there's one program that's for Zoom and there's one program that's used telephone conferencing class. Great. And I think that's a really wonderful thing to remember is that not everything, uh, when we're talking about virtual or remote programming, not everything has to be online on a computer or on a tablet. There Sometimes are it's just easier for people to access the telephone line and I and they can actually learn dance through the telephone. There's so much of the, the, the template of dance is, is just, as is, is can be discussed. Can be, it's just, can be discussed. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Bojana, you're in a slightly different position. Do you wanna share with everybody the project that you're working on and, yeah. and maybe a couple of um, examples of things that you've heard from the organizations you've been working with about yeah. how their priorities have changed in the past few months? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, at Mac uh, right now, uh, yeah, I mean, we've had to pivot as well, like so many other organizations, like we are primarily, uh, you know, we, we help a lot with, um, we provide professional development opportunities, workshops, um, resources, um, and so that's had to change um, right now just because of budgeting and how things have been changing within in the New York City metro area. Uh, so right now we've been concert, uh, concentrating on two large grants and um, uh, with my project, uh, with this grant, uh, we are mapping virtual access and cultural institutions during the pandemic. So you're really trying to document what is currently going on. Uh, while, what has happened while people had to transition from in-person programming um, and to virtual remote programming. Uh, so I've been really, really lucky uh, to talk to I, you know, dozens of different organizations in the New York City metro area, taking time, like hour, hour and a half with different folks working in these access positions and cultural institutions and talking about what, you know, what it was like to transition, what were the challenges, what were the unexpected benefits of having more time and kind of having to go within the organization um, and having to do to program virtually, um, asking them what do they wish they had in the beginning uh, of all of this, of this transition. Um, and what I'm, you know, so I'm taking these conversations and surfacing information from them to create a survey, uh, which I will be sending out very soon. So if anybody's interested in that, please uh, reach out to me in the email, uh, my email that will be provided later. Um, if you want to, you know, participate in the survey, or if also you just want to talk with me about your experience with your your cultural institution, uh, eventually we'll be using this uh, information in the survey uh, to create a, a toolkit and a series of webinars to help uh, other organizations. Something similar to this, um, but I think also trying to focus on the different uh, sizes of organizations, different needs of organizations, and. Um, also uh, taking a look at what has happened over the past couple of months and how maybe access has changed. But so, I mean, I think some of the the bigger kind of whole picture things uh, that I've gathered from the organizations I've spoken with, um, which I, I find really interesting is there's been um, some organizations have just started uh, to really focus on access and when they haven't before in the built environment. So now they're implementing captioning and sign language interpreting and they're just learning to do it. Um, and uh, I think that there has been uh, also a lot of restructuring and reframing of their content and programming uh, to make it uh, make engaging virtual access. Um, 
but you know, I, I think a lot of people in, in March and April just didn't know what to do. And, and there was a lot of figuring out how to do things, you know, checking out different webinars and sharing information with other organizations. And um, there was a lot of uh, this expanded kind of interdependence uh, that, I, that I picked up on from these conversations, museums really relying on each other uh, for information. But um, one thing, uh, you know, you, you can go to 10 different webinars and lectures and read all the articles, but eventually uh, institutions just had to do it, just had to, you know, uh, fail forward as it were um, to just, you know, go ahead, uh, take a chance, you know, make the virtual event happen uh, and implement access and just learn from there. They just learn by doing. Um, and uh, one thing that, uh, some organizations suggested was to uh, kind of do uh, a trial run within the organization itself before you actually uh, provided the virtual event uh, live to the rest of the community. So do it just within your organization first. So you, you have that practical run through within the organization, um, you know, with the captions, with sign language interpreters, um, and just practice within your organization first if you haven't done it before. Um, so I, I think that uh, there's been a lot of learning and sharing uh, and just uh, I think something that's been really important, and Annie, I think you alluded to this in the beginning, um, you know, just uh, go ahead and, and, and doing it is, is the important thing. Uh, is with, whatever, with whatever you have at the moment, go ahead and making the uh, accessible event happen. So um, that's I think some of the bigger uh, ideas that I've come away with from having some of these conversations uh, with these different institutions. Thanks, Bajana. Those are all really helpful tips and, and sort of summaries. I want to throw it back to Naomi and to Greg as folks who have sort of developed programs. And I, and I also want to, you know, sort of remind us as a panel, some folks out there may be adapting existing programs that they've already had for folks uh, who are from various audiences with disabilities. Others may be coming to this idea of accessible programming um, brand new, and they may, they may be just dipping their toes in. So I'm wondering what we can share with them that, um, you know, how you started, did you adapt? Did you create something new out of whole cloth? Um, and what think, was that process I think, like? I think it's important to just really look at what you want to serve in your program. And you think about dance, you want you want people to feel, uh, feel ownership. So there's a lot that can be, so, so there's ownership and creativity and connection with other people. That's all, all can be, that's is not, not relegate to the computer screens. It's relegate to how you connect with. So we just we just really worked as a team to think through what, what would work and, and it's really. And there's an audience member out there, Naomi, who wants you to confirm which program you're offering over Zoom and which program you're offering over the phone, what the names of those programs they're, are. One, they're both called Movement Speaks and they're both free to for, for, uh, very accessible to everyone. And you can find the information online. And these are actually dance yes. classes. Yeah, so dance classes. There, it's it's. Please experience one. Please come, come. <laughs> you'll you'll fi you'll figure out how it's different. But so they're offering both creative movement. That's a focus, because if you imagine you can, if you imagine a curve it can be a curve can be interpreted in a lot of ways. If you if you tell someone to imagine the alignment of their spine to their to, to their tailbone, it, it's it's also can be imagined. It's using your imagination. It's great. I love how you're using sort of a different medium to to connect people to dance. It's very exciting. It's very exciting to us, and we want we will continue this and program. Just, and just to sort of great. push you a little bit further, you know, when you first started these programs, was this just an idea that you all had, thinking, "Oh, we'll do it over the phone," or did you work with your audiences? How we, can, you we kind of work. We kind of worked with with both with the audiences and also the teaching artists. We. we with the program itself, and we put in those other factors. We worked a teaching artist that was really proficient in, in voice. It was, it was just an excellent, she did just an excellent phone class. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. So it was a learning process. Yes, Greg, was, yes. Greg, do you wanna share a little bit about how, sort of the, what the process was like for you and maybe what some of your sort of maybe something, some unexpected things you learned as you were adapting your program, maybe some ways you hacked it um, to, that you would never have done if we were meeting in real life? 
Sure, sure. I think um, uh, just to echo some things Bojana has said, I, again, we were, when all this started, we were really shocked, you know, so uh, again, uh, we weren't really thinking about this stuff. We just were in pure survival mode. But again, we had, as we were doing staff check-ins and whatnot, we were reminded of our mission and what, what was important to us and this emphasis on uh, accessibility and whatnot. So again, starting where you are, we are making every mistake. I think it's important to note too that we are making every mistake in the book, right? Yes. Uh, again, you can have, you can read, as what John said, you can have all the checklists, you can attend all the webinars, right. you can do all the, but until you actually do it, yep. you are not gonna gain that experiential knowledge. So the True. best, one thing that Queen's Theaters did first, initially, before we started any program, was start an advisory committee, right, specifically focused on, on this area. Um, and that advisory committee consists of about a dozen people. All, uh, it's integrated, disabled, non-disabled people, background in, who, is, who are artists, arts administrators, academics, right? Um, but we, we convene... Tuesday. We can, there you go. We convene twice a week. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, we have a call every two weeks just to check in uh, about the program. Right and see what's going on. Now that we're in the process of actual this program going on, the TFA training, we talk every Monday morning at 11. Um, because there's so many people involved in the program itself who are teaching artists or have a hand in it. Um, so uh, as we transitioned the training to virtual this year, again, we made the pivot to just focus on monologue and scene study. And we developed the two tracks, uh, beginner and advanced, uh, just so we could allow people to feel comfortable, those people who had more experience and didn't have more experience. We have had um, deaf, hard of hearing uh, participants in the past. We don't this year, so we didn't have to provide ASL interpretation, but we do have two blind, uh, low vision uh, uh, participants who, who required audio description, and we couldn't figure out how to do this necessarily in the, uh, in the, Zoom, in the, in the Zoom room, in the virtual world. So one hack that we did was um, we have a conference call in line that Queen's Theater has, so we do, we have our two participants call into that conference line. We have our audio describers call into that conference line. Uh, and so the participants have one earbud in uh, and one earbud on the class as they're being fed their audio description. Mm -hmm. um, one issue that we're, again, learning that we have sort of, we're uh, sort of working with on the fly is getting scripts in enough time in advance, right, that are accessible and readable uh, for those people. So uh, for the blind, visually impaired folk. Um, so they can access the material and perform it, just setting them up for success. Um, but also one thing that we did prior to the program for people who applied, uh, we just made it, we used a jot form for our application, uh, just a simple jot form. We asked in that form if uh, people had any, anything that we could do to make their experience more comfortable. We gave them my contact information as a contact if they needed to make a direct point of contact. And if anybody identified anything in that form, uh, in that application process, I took the time to personally call or reach out to everyone just mm. to have a personal conversation and say, what exactly do you need? Because uh, I find in the past, e even uh, disabled people, uh, blind, visually, uh, I've had it happen in the past when we had a convening in September, you know, people would be calling for um, audio description when they really meant ASL or ASL mm. when they really meant audio description. So people's own understanding of the uh, accessible features uh, we're confused, right? So it's always a good idea just to make that personal connection. You can never go wrong with that. It never hurts to ask, right. right, and get all the information to clear any ambiguity and set people's expectations. I think even if you were starting from a very, uh, wherever you're starting from, again, as long as you can set people's expectations, your audience expectations or your participants' expectations, that will go a long, long way. And making that, making that personal connection will do a lot of work and have that conversation continue. Um, accessibility is not a checklist. It is sort of a living, right. evolving, ever moving, you know, ever changing thing and will be different depending on who enters your space uh, from day to day, year to year, month to month. Jana, it sounds like you have feelings about that statement. Oh, I, I, I completely wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree with her, with Greg is saying is, you know, access is absolutely not a checklist and it's, you know, uh, it's not something that can just be set in stone. You can't set it and forget it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, people, even though you might have 10 people who come in with low vision or who are blind, um, there's still a variety of different needs within that, that group. Um, and that, and, and Greg, I, I also really appreciate what you said about calling people, taking that time um, to just be in touch with people, especially now. Um, Something else somebody uh, said uh, in one of my discussions um, 
was that, you know, access isn't about the content in your museum. Um, it's about the people, you know, and I think you get caught up with, okay, how do we, okay, we got it. We need to put together a slideshow of, of this exhibit and do, 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 and do all this. And, and sometimes we forget about the people, actual people that we're serving. And sometimes, you know, not having like the, the best photo, you know, that's online or the best description, but being in touch with the people who we're serving is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to also asking what is needed. Just and, then, and then finding out what, what, how it works, how it's been responded to other people yeah. respond to what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Or like, hey, evaluate how, afterwards. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Or even during this time with the pandemic, just being human beings. How it worked, how it worked. Paying attention to how it works is very true. I know when we've been running programs at MoMA, we've been checking in even in the middle of the program. Yes. Is this yes. okay? Are you guys comfortable? Yes. Should we right. move on to something else? Yes. Is this what you actually exactly. want? Um, and one other comment. I know, you know, Greg, you were very fortunate that you're able to sort of connect individually with all your audience members. You know, sometimes folks might be offering programs and they might not know who their audience is ahead of time. Mm. I know with, with MoMA, we were very fortunate. For example, we piloted a uh, a program for deaf audiences. And we uh, were sort of daunted a little bit by the challenge of doing this without use, being able to use a deaf educator, which is something we're not, we're not using mm. our students educators right now. So we did it interpreted in this way. We used a, a speaking educator and we used interpreters. And we were very fortunate enough to have wonderful interpreters who allowed us to pay them for their time to basically sit and let us ask them questions and run through things ahead of time. And um, these are folks that have a lot of experience. And again, I don't wanna set up the, the access professionals for more demands on their time because they're extremely busy right now. But if you're able to pay folks or if you're able to you know, find out from folks who have done this, Mac offers a weekly membership call for Mac members and you can find out how to member on the Mac website. You wanna share about that, Bojana? Yeah, it's, it's actually bi-weekly. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, yes, it's bi-weekly and, uh, yeah, it's a, usually there's between 20 and 30 different people coming to the, these meetings to talk about new things that have been going on in the field, um, mostly, you know, the New York City uh, metro area. Uh, we have different people coming to, to speak um, uh, uh, about projects they're working on. Uh, we had some folks, uh, last time I was in a meeting from Job Path, just talking about uh, employment uh, opportunities and how they're making that happen. Um, but it's, it's, it's a great place also just to share information, um, to, to share resources and tools. Um, and uh, yeah, so if, if you aren't a member or if you haven't uh, checked out what Mac has been doing, uh, we are more than ever trying to be uh, a centralized space for these kinds of resources right now uh, for virtual access. So there's, um, like I said, we're working on the survey right now, which is like this, this really big push for that right now. This, this is a, the big thing that we're working on. Um, so you can either email me or check out the website for updates on that. Um, but there are also a lot of other resources and ways to be involved and to, to, uh, be more involved with other organizations, uh, working on similar things and access in the New York city area. Thanks, Greg. Can I, add, um, yeah, go ahead, this Greg. Is Greg can I, one thing? I just, uh, you know, cost comes up a lot, right? Uh, in terms of accessibility in these features. And cost is definitely a factor. Like, I don't want to uh, minimize that or anything like that. These things do cost money. But, you know, we spend so much, I think we can spend so much time, energy, and effort talking about the cost of accessibility and not talk about the cost of exclusion, mm -hmm. right? What are we missing by excluding so many people from our stages, our spaces, our workforces, right? Um, budgets, right. Are budgets are value statements. Right. So I think one. Um, so Queen's Theater, again, our, our directive came from the top. It came from the executive director, which unfortunately is a bit of an anomaly. Most time uh, accessibility is happening from the basement up in institutions, mm -hmm. uh, which is very unfortunate, but that's something we can work to change. But again, everyone, uh, hopefully my job and even the even th the initiative theater for all will become obsolete because eventually this stuff will just be woven into the lifeblood of the organization and the institution. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think um, so we always build in to everything that we do uh, a budget line of, around access. Right. Yeah. And because inadvertently something is going to come up. 
right? And, and if you need to throw in a budget line for just, uh, you know, um, uh, miscellaneous access needs or whatever, right? Uh, in addition to everything that you're able to offer in terms of ASL interpretation, audio description, uh, whatnot, that, that is very helpful. And again, I think it's, it would behoove the funding community to make this a priority, Absolutely. right? For cultural institutions across the city and across the five boroughs. Right. I know DCLA is doing great work, but there are a whole host of other funders. You know, if mm -hmm. if people, especially companies that tout diversity and inclusion in their mission statements, right? How how do we make this how do we make New York City the exemplar for accessibility across the city, across the country? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just that. Again, there are people like us at Queens Theater, <laughs> like Naomi, uh, like Bojana at Mac, like Annie, who can help folks. The, the resources, right, are there to help yes. people develop and, and work through that path, right, if the will and the means are there. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, Thank just you. want to say Thank it's, you. it's 30 Thank years you. past the ADA, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, oh my like, gosh. Um, yeah. it's, exactly. it's, it's not only the right thing to do, it's the law. Yeah. Right. And um, I just, I know we've talked a lot about, um, and I'll try to make this really quick, we've talked a lot about ASL interpretation and audio description and image description, and uh, but I want to also just really quick just talk about um, uh, virtual programming uh, right now, accessible virtual programming for people with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I just I had an extensive conversation, great conversation uh, with Jonathan Epstein at um, AHRC, uh, it's a service organization that works um, with people living with intellectual disabilities. And uh, there's just a, a few organizations that are putting together ready to go programming uh, for people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, it's great, MoMA is in Daniel's music, but uh, there is a need uh, for other organizations to also yes. support this yes. kind of programming. And I just really quickly, we really haven't touched on intellectual disabilities and I wanted to make sure uh, that he was able to just uh, get that in there. That's a great, that's a really great point. And we also haven't spoken specifically about working with folks with dementia, which, you know, yeah. in the spectrum of hacking and innovating, uh, yes. or hacking and adapting versus innovating. I know that's something that we've found at our museum has been a program we've had to really redesign um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just adapting something we used to do in real life sure. um, is, is for that particular audience. Um, in, in especially. So thank you for bringing that up, Bojana. So we are really, really running low on time and we have uh -oh. a couple <laughs> audience questions. Um, I also want to put it open in the last five minutes. Ah. <laughs> if there's anyone who has not been able to put their question, and this is not for, this is not necessarily for folks who, who their question just hasn't been asked yet. We're curating that a little bit um, and hopefully you'll be able to reach out to us later. But if there anyone is anyone who has not been able able to type their question into the uh, Q&A feature for access reasons. If you would like to raise your hand and ask your question verbally, if that is the only way that you will be able to ask your question, I want to invite you to do that now. If you're calling in on the phone, that, uh, that function is star nine. If you are on your computer, um, it is, let's see, it is alt Y for PC users and for Mac users, I cannot recall the, uh, the web shortcut um, for raising your hand, but hopefully if you're a computer user, you will have had the opportunity to type your question in. So I'm just putting that out there for those, especially those on the phone or those who cannot access the Q&A, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I will try to call on you. In the meantime, just want to, um, let's see. Uh, I am seeing, I am seeing two raised hands. Yes, I wanna call on, um, I'm going to call on Kathleen Coleman to ask your question now. Um, Kathleen, if you want to come on video and on, uh, on mic, um, or particularly on mic, that would be great. Hey, Kathleen, we can't hear you. I'm going to move on. What to... was Kathleen's last name? Uh, Coleman. Coleman. Okay, hold on. Kathleen, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, uh, you guys actually already answered my question. So oh, perfect. I will ah. return my hand. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I would like to call on the person who um, is at the phone number that ends in uh, 
3913. If you wanna, if you're able to unmute yourself um, or put yourself on the mic, that's star nine on your phone. I don't know if we need to do anything on our end. We'll need to give them permission. And I'm actually not seeing a hand uh, from 3913. Okay, uh, interesting. But okay. Nicholas Tong? Are you seeing a hand from 0111? Uh, no, I just see- uh, Just Nicholas. They're just at the top, yes. Okay, um, awesome. If you could, unmute, if you could uh, invite Nicholas to ask his question. Hi, yes, um, Greg, um, is it okay? Um, how do you like, I know for deaf plays, do you have like an interpreter that actually says the dialogue or is it normally just um, like, you know, for deaf actors, like deaf, deaf plays, um, do you have like an interpreter that says the dialogue while, or is it just normally just um, same call? So it, there are various uh, schools of thought and best practices around this, but what Queen's Theatre does uh, when we present any play um, for uh, that might include, uh, yeah, uh, we always provide ASL interpretation if we have any deaf actors involved in any of our programming, right? Uh, for our deaf audiences, we always provide two ASL interpreters who will interpret the entire show. Um, so um, we have created over the years a list uh, uh, of interpreters and we have various um, uh, agencies that we use. LCIS, who is interpreting today, is, is one of them, um, right? But it's our standard practice at Queen's Theatre to provide uh, two ASL interpreters uh, that will uh, interpret our, our live events. Um, for our virtual events currently, um, we uh, have provided uh, interpreters in very select cases um, for, pro uh, for those virtual uh, presentations. Um, more often than not, though, we are just providing um, uh, captioning, and that captioning can either be live or, or we will, once it's uh, recorded and in the can, so to speak, uh, we have a, a, a bevy of staff members who have uh, boned up on how to include captions uh, on uh, for for YouTube um, and other platforms um, and enter those captions in uh, after the fact and then we post them. But we always, again, set those expectations and let people see what is available for the program using those access icons um, or with any, any calls uh, ahead of time. And I wanna offer final statements for all of the panelists. And Greg, I wanna start with you and I wanna ask you to start your final statement, just, and these are very brief, 15, 20 seconds, um, but I want you to add to your final statement also how you provide audio description for your virtual programs, because I don't think you've mentioned it and I think it's kind of cool. Oh, I believe I did. I, uh, <laughs> Sorry. That's all right, I did for the, for the training program anyway. Uh, the two people that we have uh, have one earbud in and uh, our audio describers are on our conference call. And so we're listening, that's being fed in. Um, we are gonna have a presentation of those scenes on Tuesday, on Monday of next week. Um, but, and what we're doing is having to take a look at all of the scripts that were presented. Uh, there are about nine scenes that will be shared and we're gonna audio describe every single one of those scenes. Um, as final thoughts, um, I would say, again, uh, budgets are value statements. <laughs> Accessibility is a process. Just go for it. Um, and help is there uh, if you need it. There are a lot of great people who have been working very hard and very diligently uh, in this space for a long, long time. Um, and uh, you can feel free to reach out to me with my information that will be made available. Uh, if I can't help you personally, I'm more than happy to connect you with anyone across this ecosystem uh, that might be, be might be able to get you the information that you need. So Thank generous, you. Greg. Thank you. And you are not alone, folks. This is a final thought. Um, so, uh, Naomi, would you like to share one last thought, please? I just echo everything Greg said and and <laughs> what Jana said. So I just come, just be in touch. Yes. We can help you mm -hmm. with whatever issues you're dealing with. That's so great. Thank you. Rajana, anything final you want to share? Call to action, anything? Yeah, I, I think we all need to connect. Um, and Mac is really uh, working hard to do that, to be a connector. Um, and uh, 
definitely asking people to reach out to me if you're interested in participating in this survey, Mapping Virtual Access in Cultural Institutions uh, during the pandemic. It's really helpful to have these one hour long chats to really um, look at more of the social and cultural things that are going on um, with access and not just the logistics of um, you know, sign language interpretation and captioning and audio description. Uh, so please reach out to me if that is something that interests you. Um, and yeah, I think it's really important uh, right now to connect with people, um, connect with organizations organizations um, and learn from each other. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's my, my call to action. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, thank you to our panelists. Applause, applause. I realize we are a slightly over time. I'm going to invite you all to turn your cameras uh, and mics off for the moment and with a huge thank you. Um, I'd like to invite John to share the final slide on the screen with us while I do a little bit of wrapping up. Um, so the slide that John is going to share with us is um, a slide that has contact information. Now we're going to leave it up for a minute if you'd like to take a screenshot. The print is kind of small and I'm not going to be able to read it out loud, um, unfortunately. Uh, but it's got everyone's contact information. Each speaker today um, has uh, their way, the way to reach them directly. And we all agreed to offer this to you all as an opportunity uh, for you to reach out to us individually. Again, you're also going to be receiving this PowerPoint and receiving a recording of this webinar. Um, I want to do a few thank yous. I really want a heartfelt thank to our speakers. Thank you to our speakers, um, Wale, John, Greg, Naomi, Bojana, all of you all were wonderful. You had so many great things to share with us. Um, I want to also thank the folks at DCLA, the Department of Cultural Affairs, in particular, Perry Ann Carson, Sarah Cobb, David Mendel, the commissioner and the deputy commissioners who made this program possible. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it. It's been great working with you all again. Um, huge, huge thank you. Huge thank you to our access workers from LC Interpreting Services. Um, they usually are so anonymous, but I'm going to call them out by name because they had to put up with a lot of us talking really, really rapidly today. Yeah. So thank you to all of you. Um, our captioner is Elena uh, Kernevig. Um, and our interpreters were Veronica Staley and Mike Barrios. Um, I hope I pronounced those names correctly. You all were amazing. Thank you for all of the work that you do um, in making these things accessible and inclusive um, for all audiences. One more reminder, you're going to get a survey. Please fill it out. We want to make these programs and, and the Department of Cultural Affairs wants to make these programs um, what you need as, uh, as their constituents um, and as folks interested in these fields. Um, we really want you to have a voice in uh, what the web our series goes uh, goes forward. Um, we do apologize that we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but we hope that you have, they were wonderful ones that we didn't get to. We could talk for a whole another two hours, um, but we want to thank you all for taking that time to be here today. Um, and again, you know, you're not alone. Let's do this. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful Tuesday. <laughs>